Welcome to Hotspot with me, Don Penn, and for the final time on India's tour of New Zealand, Chetan Narula, who's uh, just about ready to go home now. Hello, Chetan. Hi, John. Final stop for me here in uh, Hamilton, off to Auckland tomorrow, and then uh, catching my flight back home. It's been a long trip, especially mm. since India haven't won any single game. Well, quite. We'll, we'll sort of touch on that a bit later, but uh, obviously before you, you sort of head, headed headed off to Hamilton and Auckland, the Wellington Test match, I mean, it's going to go down in history as, as Brendan McCullum's perhaps his finest hour. Was that your first triple century in a Test match that you've seen live? Absolutely. I mean, uh, triple centuries are not that uh, uh, not that common, John, in Test cricket. And I mean, obviously, there's just been 28 instances of uh, a batsman going on to score a, a triple hundred. 24 different batsmen have done it. Uh, four of them have uh, done it... Uh, Twice, obviously. So, uh, you know, not not every every day you see a triple hundred being scored in a test match, and uh, uh, was very fortunate to witness this. Obviously, the Indian team probably didn't want to witness this, but witness it. But uh, Ren McCollum played an absolute uh, gem of an innings, and uh, that's that's putting it very very mildly. I mean, given the situation and the context of the match, as well as the series that he played uh, uh, played that knock in. Um, at the same time, I mean, if you say uh, it was not just Brennan McCollum's finest hour, his knock meant that this was the finest hour for a New Zealand batsman, and actually that is saying a lot. And it was an extraordinary comeback because they were 246 runs behind on first innings. They were in all sorts of troubles. It's sort of 94 for five when he came in and everybody was sort of thinking, well, India will surely wrap it up from here, but him, BJ Watling, Jimmy Neesham just, just uh, turned it around and obviously went on to, to draw the game, which meant they won the series. And one of the greatest comebacks that, that you've certainly seen? Um, yes, definitely. Definitely one of the greatest comebacks that I have seen. Um, uh, not not uh, seen too many matches, so obviously mm. this is just my what... Uh, mm. My 14th test match in attendance. So uh, yeah, not not seen too many test matches, but at, at the same time, it's been a terrific turnaround for New Zealand. Um, yes, everybody thought that the match would get over in three days and uh, we would go home. People were actually planning to, uh, you know, fly off home early. Um, I know I was planning for uh, a trip in some or the other part of New Zealand. You know, just uh, use up five extra days that I would be getting, but that didn't really happen. I think uh, nobody really thought how flat the pitch would get after three days. Because the first couple of days, there was just too much. Especially the first day, there was just too much in the pitch. In that particular sense, India bowled very, very well. India batted also very, very well in their first innings. And in that light, they didn't really, you know, they didn't really expect to perhaps even draw the match, let alone lose it. Yet, it was such a tremendous innings from Mendel McCallum and BJ Watling that India were at one particular time on the cusp of losing the match. When I say losing the match, I don't mean that, you know, they would have definitely lost it, but, you know, they, they had lost Shikhar Dhawan, Murli Vijay, Chiteshwar uh, Pujara, three top batsmen, and Virat Kohli was given not out of an edge. So the ball was still doing a little bit, there was a little bit of cloud cover. If there would have been one more session, then perhaps New Zealand could have played with it. You know, obviously the match wouldn't have meandered to a draw. What I'm trying to say is, that India did not expect to be in the situation that they found themselves after, you know, two days of, after the first two days when they played a tremendous, tremendously good cricket. And that just goes to show how well Ren McCallum and BJ Watling batted. Yes, the pitch flattened out. Yes, there was not too much in it for the bowlers from the third day onwards. But, again, you know, talking about the context of the game, from 94 for 5, when you're still trailing by 150 to 50 runs, 50 odd runs, to go on and take a lead of 430 runs, that is an exceptional display of batting. Not only Brendan McCullum, but also B.J. Watling. I remember in particular that B.J. Watling did not give even a half a chance to the Indian batsmen. McCullum gave them chances, you know, he, on, the, on the third day he was dropped twice. Uh, the drop that Virat Kohli put down, it was, you know, that should have really been taken. Ishan Sharma on his follow through with all his hair there, you know, not, uh, not really a proper chance. Uh, then again, on the third day, you know, on the fourth day, you know, he etched the ball and it just went past Shikhar Dhawan. So, half chances, but B.J. Watling never gave them a half a chance. So it just shows a tremendous amount of application 
the New Zealand batsman put in, um, you know, to draw this match. And absolutely wonderful display of batting to defy India and uh, deny them a very, very rare overseas test win. So if you look at the, the tour as a whole, Chet, the one-day international series was lost by India 4-0. All they had to show for it was that, that tie. They've lost the test series 1-0 to a side ranked a fair way below them. Just um, just give us your your sort of overall assessment of, of this tour. Well, not really a good, good uh, tour, obviously, from the Indian point of view. Um, let's start with the ODIs first. I think uh, it's pretty clear that India really need to go back to their... Uh, you know, drawing board and sort start out what they're trying to do for next year, because uh, you know there's no confidence in the bowling. And it's only expects to give away 300 runs every time his bowlers go on the field. He doesn't want to bat. He doesn't want to, uh, you know, bat first because he thinks that they're not going to be able to defend anything less than 350 runs, and the batsman cannot score 350 runs every time. Um, in these conditions, Shikhar Dhawan will not always give you the good start. Rohit Sharma will always be slow in starting, so perhaps. They need to rethink their opening combination. You know, also the middle order is really weak at the moment. Ajin Rahane has looked a million dollars in the test matches. He really needs to bring that form to the, to the ODIs as well. Chiteshwar Pujara is in the Asia Cup squad, and I would really, really love him to go to England and play some ODIs as well. And, you know, just get those innings going, get some runs going, and, you know, really become a very good batsman for me and the ODIs as well. Because at the moment, just relying on one person, Virat Kohli, and then MS Dhoni to finish off the game because Suresh Raina, Ambati Rairu, Ajinkya Rahane have not done enough in the middle order. Rohit Sharma and Shikhar Dhawan are wasting their starts. So that's where India's problems, India's core strength has always been batting in ODI cricket and, and more so than ever now, especially because MS Dhoni doesn't have any confidence in his bowlers. There's still a year to go, so perhaps you know they can just really wake up and use and rebuild some confidence in their players and redraw some of their strategies. Apart from that, um, John, coming to the test side, I think despite the one loss, I would say the test series was still a positive because, you know, you really have to see the test series in South Africa and New Zealand, you know, in difference, you know, from what happened earlier with the 8 mil. So in, in that particular sense, you cannot just say, okay, this is a continuation of that. No, this is a whole new team. There is, you know, just a few players who have actually played overseas, Dhoni, Kohli, Zahir, Ashwin, Rohit Sharma was in the squad for the Australia series. He did not play a test match. Kohli did not play in England. Ashwin did not play in England. Ishan Sharma obviously has played some matches. Uh, Zaheer has played matches. Dhoni has played matches. So the core of the team is entirely new. It's a fresh beginning. Yes, India has had a poor run overseas, but you cannot judge that in that light. However, if you just you know take it individually, these series. They showed some great, you know, skill in the South Africa series, losing it on the last day. Again, you know, here they've kept on fighting till the last day, to till the second last day to, you know, draw level in the series. And even in Auckland, they had a, such an amazing comeback. They've been learning. It's a it's a learning process. The batsmen have been learning to leave the ball and play proper shots. They didn't. They got a good start in South Africa. They didn't get a good start here, and they came back. Similarly, the bowlers, they have been learning, you know, how to bowl in South Africa, how to bowl in New Zealand. Zahir has looked old, but at the same time, he has, he's been an influence. Ishan Sharma and Homer Shami has, have been a revelation. Ishan Sharma has also come up with some good performances. Let's just forget what happened in the past. Again, look at these two test series in singularity. So, it's, it's a process. It's a very, very slow process, but half the result will start to come in in the near future. Maybe in England, maybe in Australia, we don't really know. But at the moment, I would not suggest and the test series in South Africa and New Zealand have been, despite the scoreline, they have been total losses. Yes, in New Zealand, perhaps they should have won more. They should have done a little better, especially given how poorly the New Zealand team is ranked. You know, but uh, I think we have to see that in independence of uh, how in how India have performed. If you're just talking about India here, yeah, I think they are learning their lessons. I think um, it's a good marker for the future, especially in the batting department. Taking a lot of positives there, Chetan, which is, is always good to see. Now, I've seen a little bit of criticism of Mahendra Singh Dhoni's captaincy. I think Sarav Ganguly sort of come out and said, called him obnoxious, which I'm not sure is is right or not. I just want to get your view on, on where whether you think Dhoni is at all in any threat or whether he should carry on as Indian captain. It's a few games now since since he since they've won, but 
surely isn't isn't he is he still the right man to lead India? Absolutely, I think so. Um, but having said that, he's not the right man to lead India into the future. We're looking at a very short term now. Um, he became captain in 2007. Next year, the World Cup will be eight years since he's been captain. So, uh, I would say after the 2015 World Cup, you know, India should start moving on. Why? Because a, it's just one year to know to to the ODIs, and obviously he's a very good captain in ODI cricket or limited overs cricket. But when you're talking about um, the Test series, you know, you have the tours of England and South Africa coming in. If you really wanted to groom a new captain. Should have done it at home when we had the 10 test matches, and you know some confidence would have gotten into the players, which actually again went into the side. They, you know the side gained in confidence, and that's why they're touring abroad now, learning. That's the learning process. A new captain comes in, and the swan of 8 nil is already hanging over his head. You know with the 4 nil losses in England, 4 nil losses in Australia. So not the right time. And obviously, when I say, you know, you have to look at this in singularity, I think MS Tony has led the side well in South Africa. His team has done well in South Africa. His team has done relatively well, continuing the same process. The scoreline might be, you know, not in their favor, but they're continuing the process in New Zealand. And you have to see this as a fresh team, as a new team. When you see the overall picture, yes, MS Tony is a limited test player especially overseas, MS Tony is a limited test player and when a player becomes captain that rubs off on his captaincy the captaincy rubs off, rubs off on his game so here also we're seeing the same thing he is limited in his um, in his approach to captaincy because he is a limited test player overseas That's that's been there for quite a while but India really at this point of time do not have an option I absolutely do not think that Virat Kohli should be leading the Indian test side in England or in Australia He's in, in a great batting touch, just let him be, let him become the batsman we all want him to become. There is no other leader at the moment. After the 2015 World Cup, when Virat Kohli is, you know, at the prime, then perhaps maybe we can look at it. And, uh, you know, as I said, if, uh, you know, even if uh, Dhoni Leaf is not made the test captain again, you'll have two different captains. India have never been comfortable uh, with split captaincy. You know, we just handled one year with Anil Kumbhay and Ms. Dhoni. I don't think uh, we have that sort of situation at the moment. That a senior player could take over the test side. I think Dhoni is the senior most player, apart from Zahir, and we don't know how long Zahir is going to play. So, in my personal opinion, I don't think this is the right time to start talking about Dhoni's captaincy. That will be probably after the 2015 World Cup. Final, the sort of cricket-related question for you, Chetan. India, they're off to Bangladesh pretty soon now. They're going to play in the Asia Cup. Then they've got the ICC World 2020. Then there's the IPL. Do you think it's a good thing for them to almost carry on playing now and sort of keep or sort of try and get back into form and really just sort of keep on, keep on the wagon, if you like, not too, you know, not too much time off now to, to think about what's happening, just keep on playing? Do you think that's a good thing? Well, it's always the same case with India, isn't it? I mean, they, they play non-stop cricket. Um, I remember it's it's been a year, but last year this time they were playing Australia. Then they played the IPL, and then they went. Um, uh, then they played the IPL, and uh, um, they had a uh, had a couple months. Uh, then then small tours came up. You know they went to Zimbabwe, they went to West Indies Champions Trophy. So they kept on playing even after the Champions mm. Trophy. They kept on playing the West Indies the Zimbabwe tour. Obviously the B team went. Then the Champions League T20. Then the home series, seven match series against Australia. Then there was no West Indies tour, then the West Indies tour, then South Africa, then New Zealand. It's the same with Indian team. I mean, they, they, they play continuous cricket. Yes, it hampers their ability to absorb, uh, you know, perhaps what the games are. But then again, you know, that's the demand of professional cricket, modern day cricket right now, especially for the Indian team. But, you know, you're always going to be in the move, on the move. So you have to reflect whatever downtime you get. Now, they are on an 18 hour or 20 hour flight back to India, I think that's a good time to reflect on your cricket. There's nothing much else to do. Uh, you know, the, the home movies on the aircrafts are not very good nowadays. Or even if they are, you, know, you can just switch it off and think about your game. So that's a good time to think about your game. You can go home, take two, three days off, get in the Asia Cup mode. You know, the fact of the matter is that there is so much little time, so much asked of modern day cricketers, that whatever downtime you get, you have to reflect on your game. And that is on, that is the only way you're going to advance and there is, especially for Indian cricketers, there is no other way. I don't think so. 
And uh, finally, Chetan, you've you said it's been a, a long trip for you out there in New Zealand. I wonder if you could sort of pick up, pick out uh, one or two sort of favourite memories, whether they be cricket related or, or, or perhaps not, from your time time in New Zealand. I know you've you've really in, enjoyed your time out there and been sort of blown away, maybe by by some of the places you've visited. Absolutely, some of the very beautiful places um, in Hamilton. I saw a sunset over the White Arthur River, um, pink hues, very brilliant, very beautiful. Napier, the beach was sandy with pebbles. Again, very beautiful, very windy. Wellington, very windy. Auckland, a lot of hustle bustle and the sky tower. All of it, the entire country is very, very beautiful. A memorable trip for me. And I went to Taupo today and I skied over from, from 15,000 feet. So I think that's the highlight of the tour for me, apart from the cricket. So I don't think there's a, the beauty or anything on that scale can match diving out of a plane, jumping out of a plane from 15,000 feet. So, very memorable trip, uh, very lucky to come on this trip, come to New Zealand, it's very far off, not many people make it to New Zealand, so, yeah, enjoyed every bit of it and taking back a lot of memories, both from on the field and off it. Great stuff, well, well thank you very much for your time over the last uh, last few weeks and uh, we all wish you obviously a very safe trip and I imagine we'll be catching up with you once again on the hot spot certainly after the Asia Cup or during the Asia Cup and when the ICC World 2020 gets underway next stop Bangladesh for you yes uh, John we'll be lucky to go to Bangladesh as well so yeah I'm pretty much on a world tour and speak soon <laughs> from back home great stuff well thank you to Chet and thank you for watching hot spot we do hope you can join us again for our next uh, catch up with our contributors as we cover world cricket all around the world. Do subscribe to our YouTube channel as well, that way you'll get the very latest news from us. You'll, you'll be notified when our latest videos are released. But from now, from Chetan and from myself, thank you very much for watching and goodbye for now. Goodbye, John.